The host has started broadcasting the meeting on Facebook. Close this meet by button button to enter Zoom meet. Meredith Hayden is the host now. Bill Kelly can use the headset. Um, I think it's switched over. All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to National Blind Sports Week. This is the final day of our four-part webinar series, and today's topic is the blind sports community. Um, my name is Mary Bai Huking. I am the sport program coordinator here at USABA, and you also might know me as a former goalball player on the women's national team. Um, we have each day we have a social media takeover as well as our evening webinar series so you can tune in there um, and if you're interested in joining us in person we have our breakfast with champions on Friday October 28th uh, and it's the 13th annual breakfast with champions presented by Anthem that will be at 7 30 mountain time um, with a live stream available at 8 a.m if you're tuning in from around the country um, we would love to know what everyone is doing to celebrate National Blind Sports Week, as well as National Blind Sports Day this coming Saturday. So share on social media, and uh, we'll make sure to promote that across our social media channels. Um, tonight, I'm so excited to be joined by two of our speakers. We have Wendy Fagan, who is the founder of Envision Blind Sports. Wendy, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Yeah, thanks for having me. And our second speaker is Kirsten French, who is the program manager at the Northwest Association for Blind Athletes. Kirsten, thank you so much for being here tonight. Yes, thanks. Glad to be here. So as we get started, um, could you guys both kind of share a little bit about your backgrounds and how you got involved in the blind sports community? Go ahead, Kirsten. So as Mary Bai mentioned, I am the programs manager of our Camp Spark and Sports Adaptations of the Northwest Association for Blind Athletes. And this is our 16th year with NWABA. And our mission is to provide life-changing opportunities through sports and physical activity for individuals who are blind or visually impaired. And we do that throughout Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Montana through in-person events, including our camp programs and our sports adaptations programs and our ongoing programs. Additionally, outside of that, we also have our virtual programs that reach athletes of all ages and ability levels throughout the entire US. Uh, I'm Wendy, and I am the Executive Director of Envision Blind Sports. We are based in Southwest Pennsylvania, and we're a grassroots organization that provides year-round sports and physical activity for individuals that are blind and visually impaired anywhere from camps and clinics. We have a full ski season. We do a lot of outdoor recreation, over 25 different sports. Uh, one of our best claims to fame is our week-long summer camp, where mm. we get quite a bit of number of students why you would think we might only serve as Pennsylvania athletes. We had about 10 different states represented at our camp this summer. And if anyone's willing to get to our program, we will service and provide them. Um, doesn't matter where you're from, but we do service a large number of individuals from Pennsylvania, Ohio, New York, Maryland, Virginia, that type of region. But we have gone uh, as far as Hawaii and Russia and other random places of athletes that come to visit us. So all are welcome. Uh, lots of fun, different things that we do. That's incredible. You guys both like reach quite a range of, you know, both location. And I know you guys cover quite a range of topics as far as the programs you offer and camps. Um, what, what made you each want to get involved in your community? How were you in initially introduced to the blind sports community and, and what made you pursue like working within it? Do you want to go first? Sure. You, you want me to go first? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay, so uh, many, well, I, I think I have two big pushes. One was just my undergrad and master's degree. I always knew that I wanted to work with individuals with disabilities. I always knew that I wanted to do it in a physical activity setting, and it all just merged into adaptive physical education. And then as I was getting more involved, I realized that I could merge my love of sport. And some people in the field really directed me to say, like, try everything, but then really focus on something you love. I fell into blind sports and fell in love with blind sports. And um, that that just got me to where I am today. And I think the other huge influence was my mom. 
she was just a great role model, someone that just basically taught me the power of being a volunteer. And that's how I threw myself into it. You know, I was fortunate to have a full-time job teaching and was able to do this kind of on the side. And so those two things together got me where I am today. Yeah, I think that's how a lot of those in our community kind of start off is that volunteer role, you know, and you mm -hmm. I think it's such a it's such a cool way to get connected because you get this really up close look at all the athletes and, you know, you get to connect with them in this really meaningful way. And then I could I could see how that would kind of, you know, propel you in the direction of like really wanting to be involved and and wanting to create some of your own programs. That's that's really cool. Uh, Kirsten, what about you? Yes. So I did my background is in. So I did some work in deaf education, as well as I originally taught special education after I graduated from college and after doing some work in both teaching and then in rec therapy, I realized how much I was missing the recreational aspect of it. So when I went back to grad school, I went to Slippery Rock University, and that's where Wendy was a professor and really just fell in love with specifically the aspect of blind sports and getting the opportunity to play goalball and the opportunity to see the ways that these sports are so life-changing for athletes who are blind and visually impaired. And as I came out here originally for a goalball tournament, and it turned out that my organization was putting on the tournament and was helping to sponsor it. And that was at a time that I was graduating, looking for a job and then realizing how much I really wanted to be in blind sports specifically. Everything worked out well. I had originally thought that I was going to be in this position for two years. It's six years later and I'm not looking back and have loved the way that Sport can be used as such a catalyst for changing the lives of people who have a visual impairment, and it can be used to for empowerment and quality of life and greater independence and the ways that that seeps into every area of life and every aspect of life, even apart, even outside of the sports and physical activity realm. I think it is really incredible to see the full circle um, <laughs> you know, like how Kirsten, you kind of came from working with Wendy and then were able to really spread that and spread what you had learned all the way off to the West Coast. That's, it's just really cool to see how things, you know, kind of grow and um, work off of one another. Uh, tell me a little bit more, and you started to kind of go into this, but tell me a little bit more about the individuals that you've been able to work with and the kind of changes that you've seen in the, you know, kids and adults with visual impairments who have been part of your programs. Yes, I've had the huge opportunity to work with athletes from birth all the way through the entire life spectrum and over the years see the ways that they have been able to grow in different areas. We had one athlete that I had worked with for a while and getting to know her from the first time that she came to an event with us and talking with her mother about having her come to camp and how impactful that was and how much that that could change. And seeing six years later, she is, after she left camp, she was competing at the junior nationals for track and field. Originally, she had been really heavy into judo and was still very much enjoying this, but was able to find her passion for track and field and head into that and then be able to see that come to fruition now as she's 15 years old and then being able to start talking with her of all right next year you can come back as a counselor and as you become adult this is how you can engage as an adult and then be able to see that those how those athletes impact myself in my own life and that I and I can look to them as mentors in the same way that they might look to myself or other staff or other volunteers as mentors and how impactful that is throughout the whole lifetime. Yeah, it sounds like you've really gotten to see the entire scope of things with, with such a wide age range. Um, Wendy, I have obviously had the chance to work really closely with Callahan, who came from your program. So I know that you've been doing great things. Um, what are some of the experiences you've had with the individuals that you've been able to work with? Ah, uh, they're endless. I, I think I've been doing this for over 30 years, so I could spend hours talking about it and just, just, you know, 
just like Callahan, he came as this totally awkward 12 year old to camp. And, you know, you just looked at him and you, you just didn't, you don't, you didn't really look at him and said, I think that's going to be a Paralympian someday. <laughs> and he just fell in love. And I think I, that's one of the things that I stress is that I can remember watching Kirsten and watching her fall in love with blind sports and just knowing and finding. And I think that's such a big thing for not just our athletes, but also all of our volunteers is that they fall in love with it, much like the athletes fall in love with it. And to watch Callahan go from just not even knowing what goalball was at the age of 12 to playing, you know, where is he in Berlin right now playing? And that is, that's just mind blowing. And, and as, as much as I love the Callahan story, we have a million stories of kids that it just makes such a big impact. Like I think about our kids that come to camp for a week and they learn like, wow, I could be wrestling. And mm -hmm. then they go back home and they talk to the wrestling coach and be like, I should be wrestling. And the next thing you know, you see them on the videos on Facebook, wrestling for their junior high teams and their high school teams, or, you know, deciding to do track and field. Um, that to me is where we see that increase in the confidence of our athletes. And that, that that's really our job is to, mm -hmm. as much as we'd love to be everything for them, it's impossible. They live all over the place. We can't be that. It's not like your local soccer team. You have to make sure that we're giving them the skills so that they can become self-advocates so they can go back into their high schools and all of their levels of school and say, hey, sports for me too. Because so many of them um, need to be educated on what's, what's there for them so that they can go back and educate the people in their lives about the things that they should be doing as a blind athlete. Mm -hmm. I would agree. I think that that has been something that has been one of the most impactful things I've seen over the past six years. And I think you probably even longer of how that growth of having athletes leave programs and be able to go back and compete on their school teams and seeing that a little bit. And then it becomes, it grows and grows and seeing that. And over the past year, the number of coaches that have reached out and have asked, how do I adapt cross country? All right. Or a camper that says, all right, I'm going out. I'm, I do, I swim. I am wrestling this year. I I'm playing in recreational soccer from a young age. And that that's for every athlete. Some of the athletes and campers that I've had at camp who have been at a more foundational level have been some of the most impactful to see them say, all right, now I can go and wrestle. I'm competing in my rec soccer team. I am, I'm going to do that this year and seeing the ways, how much that grows year round, it really helps to extend that. And it's been so interesting to see that grow exponentially over the past six years and increase. Yeah, well, and when it comes to blind sports organizations, that's that's one of the things that I have really experienced is just seeing how different organizations are able to give kids the tools um, and just that starting point of like confidence, <laughs> like we believe in you, we believe that you are capable of these crazy mm -hmm. cool things, um, you know, and I, I think a lot of blind sports organizations give kids with visual impairments these really unique opportunities, mm -hmm. right, you get to try cool different sports that maybe other kids at your school haven't done. Um, but then also kind of like you were mentioning, it's, it gives them the confidence to take that back to their school and say, okay, I did this super cool event, or I did this really cool sport. I think I could do all the things that we're doing here. Mm -hmm. And here are some of the ways that I've learned to adapt to that. So yeah, that's absolutely such a, <laughs> such a cool thing to be able to spread throughout the community. And giving the students the chance to go back and teach their peers about mm -hmm. all the cool sports. So we go into some of the high schools and you go, we try to go into the high school, say where one of our athletes might be the only mm -hmm. blind kid in the school and then show all the physical education classes, goal ball and let them play and let them put on the pads and the eye shades. And all of a sudden they look at that individual differently because they realize like this, this this kid, I, don't, I didn't even realize the things that they could do and it just makes them so aware and then gets them excited about making sure that things are more accessible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And kind of going off of that, you've talked about these situations where, you know, your athletes are connecting with the community. Um, what has been your guys's experience as far as 
being blind sports organizations and connecting with your community? Have you been able to find resources? What have those partnerships looked like? And, and how did you kind of go about fostering that? Yes, so the Pacific Northwest was something that was unique when I moved out here that the adapted physical education isn't something that is as prominent out here as it is on the East Coast. And so that was something I found unique when I moved out here and uh, through working with camp as campers comp leave camp, they we do an assessment on them and the, it's an assessment that shows not which is what the camper is able to accomplish, as well as the adaptations, modifications and accommodations that were used to make those goals happen and whether it's when this camper used high contrast equipment or equipment that was in a specific color or whether it's a beeping ball or a bell ball, tactile map, a tactile diagram, and then to talk, looking into teaching methods, whether it's physical assistance, tactile modeling, verbal cues, sending that on to the, the campers, teacher, the visually impaired, orientation, mobility specialist, PE teacher, family, and really encouraging. This is how what we what they did at camp, this is how it can be added into any PE classroom or after school sport or extracurricular activity has been huge and exceptionally impactful in building those communications. Additionally, one of the programs that I run is our sports adaptations program where we provide adaptations and consultations with anyone throughout our area, as well as virtually we're able to work nationally when someone reaches out and says I'm teaching basketball and I don't know how to adapt it or what are some cues that I can use and it's allowed that community that bridge with the community to be built and to be fostered and have been able to see that increase on teachers reaching out with questions on campers and other athletes having different experience than someone who's older than them when they are in PE because they've been able to have those resources and be able to see how it grows. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's great stuff. I think that when I think about community support, I think we wouldn't be functioning without it. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that without just the, the school supports is one thing, but when, for like someone with us, you know, Northwest is very blessed with buildings and spaces and places to put equipment. We are mm -hmm. a very mobile unit with no set place with part-time volunteers and so literally we'd be nothing without the community the mm -hmm. community is the reason that we're functioning they're the reason because if you don't have a permanent space and you don't have permanent employees you learn to use your community resources we have mm -hmm. some people and i'm sure that person will agree and probably has a hundred stories just like mine i mean we have paddleboarding groups that are willing to come out and teach paddleboarding we have wrestling mm -hmm. coaches that are willing to come out and wrestle um college basketball teams, our tennis team, uh, judo coaches. Uh, and then you have people like the Penns Foundation and just mm -hmm. organizations that without their support, you just can't even function. The Lions is, and, mm -hmm. and then you look at some of the colleges. We went to a new college this year and the support we got when we got there from, we went to Penn State Barron for the first year would just blow you away and people were coming up. It's like, we want to partner with you. We want to do you do things with you. A local um, archery place called said, hey, next year when you come, can we do this? And then we work with a local uh, high ropes course. And they were like, that's the best day that we've ever had. And, you know, mm -hmm. just at the university, random swim coaches and things were coming up and saying, you know, we want to be part of this movement. We didn't even know this existed. We played goalball um, in their gym and people just were, stunned and just stopped and like how did I not know this how can I be in the world of sport and not know goal ball how can yeah. I you know um <laughs> just everything so honestly it's I just don't think that in the land of disability sport and in especially in the land of blind sport I think it's absolutely impossible to function without your community and it's mm -hmm. so important because with every community member that you educate then it just that ripple effect just keeps growing and growing and more and more people find out and you get and you find those athletes that are hiding somewhere that we haven't found yet so and people right. click on their social media and people share it mm -hmm. you know like look I wrestled here or I helped teach judo here and so yeah it's 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 probably the number one key to our success and to our ability to keep going we we would be mm -hmm. 
in a world of hurt without community, community support and partnerships. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we have, as you guys know, kind of an interesting landscape throughout the U.S. where we kind of have pockets of really incredible blind sports organizations, mm-hmm. but... As you also know, there are plenty of places within the U.S. where that's just not true, where athletes don't really have access to an organization. Um, For any of those organizations, as you're talking about, you know, the importance of partnership and community support, how would you suggest that newer organizations go about fostering that and creating that and kind of beginning those connections? I think just, I, I think what I've been most surprised by is that just reaching out and asking those questions and being able to start with an explanation and offer to say, I'm happy to help. I'm happy to show you. And I'd love you to meet one of our athletes. And even when we serve some areas that are exceptionally rural and having an athlete go to a karate dojo or they want to do some sort of physical activity that's in their community and to be able to go into that space and say I have the right to be here I have the right to access this but also please let me know if you have any questions on what my experience is going to be and then on our end or on other people's end to say and we're here to support you if you have any questions if you have anything that you might be concerned about Don't hesitate to reach out because the more those questions are asked and the more that they are answered, the less that there is an assumption and those guesses of this isn't possible, this isn't going to make a difference are assuaged and it it increases that accessibility and that inclusion across the board, no matter what the circumstance may be. So it's really kind of bringing those organizations kind of closer to the athletes and giving them that that one-on-one experience, sort of like the, I'm not just telling you the story here is, here is an athlete who can show you their experience. Mm-hmm. And, and I think another thing that we have to talk about when we're talking about meeting all the needs of the athletes that aren't being met, all those athletes that we haven't even found yet. I mean, obviously we have some real grave concerns in America because there aren't enough programs mm-hmm. between Pennsylvania and out to Oregon, I mean, how many other blind sport organizations jump to mind? And that to me is tragic. And I think Mm -hmm. what we have to do when you talk, well, what do we say to these people? I would say, you know, you could go, I mean, if you go to Northwest, they they have this amazing multi-state program, which is what you aspire to get to. And, but I think we also have to make sure that, that, I mean, for instance, when Kirsten and that, they do some of the two day camps and they get kids in for two days to be able to say to some other people like, hey, you don't have to do a year round program. Mm -hmm. Why don't you start the two day program? And I think with kids that are blind and visually impaired, we have to increase the number of activities that are multiple days and have a space because it's so difficult as, and I'm sure Mary Mm Bai, you know, as an athlete, that if I offer something for two hours, how many parents are gonna drive the extension that they may have to drive? How many of them would drive six hours in a day for two day activity? Mm-hmm. But I know that Northwest does a lot of this where they're like, hey, we're gonna do a two, three day activity. We're gonna do five day, six day camps. And we have found that if we can start offering some of those, then if we can show other people in other parts of the country, like you could start small. You, you, you don't have to be a year round program. Maybe you want to be a ski program. Maybe you want to be, um, you know, a, a weekend goal ball camp twice, twice a year. Maybe you want to, mm-hmm. you know, introduce wrestling and have a wrestling camp. That's one of the things Cal and I talked about when he was out a couple of weeks ago is that we should be having weekend goal ball camps because we mm-hmm. need to get into areas because, you know, if Cal and Eliana come to visit, And Mindy comes to visit and I only have them for two hours. I can't drag kids from a six hour radius, but Mm -hmm. if they can come into this area and stay for two days and we can house our kids and they can do nonstop goal ball for two days, then you're going to excite people and show them like this is let's take this model and put it somewhere else. And I think we've, we have just got to figure out in America how we can make more of that happen because while some of us are out there, you know, getting it done. There's just so many kids still not getting access or getting their needs met. Or I, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure that Kirsten will agree with with this one too, is that I'm really tired of getting a 12 year old in my program whose parent says, I didn't even know there was blind sports. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, this is 2022 and we're still struggling with the fact that we're getting teenagers into our program that have never heard of the sports that we're offering or never knew, like I can play basketball. No one ever told me I can play basketball Mm -hmm. or so we have work to do. Yeah, absolutely. I, and well, when it comes to that, do you think that sort of the recruitment piece and getting the word out there, do you think that's one of the more difficult challenges as far as blind sports organizations? Because because there are lots of other things you mm-hmm. face as far as fundraising and logistics and staffing, getting volunteers. But is that kind of what you see as one of the one of the biggest issues, one of the biggest hurdles? Uh, before this meeting, I met down with my the two people that work for me part time and we talked about some of your questions. And when that's hysterical that you said it, because we put it as the number one issue. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We, we put of all education is an issue, awareness is an issue, funding is an issue. But if we had to pick one issue we would say athlete recruitment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, which yeah. is really, is so difficult state to state. I think that's one thing that a lot of people don't realize is um, just because of like the spread and whether or not kids are encouraged to go to a school for the blind or if they are completely mainstreamed and they're working with itinerant teachers, like it, the landscape is so different state to state. So how, it's really hard to figure out how do we reach these kids? And so oftentimes athletes are hearing a different narrative. They're hearing the narrative of that information may be out there, but they're hearing the narrative of this isn't for you. You're not able to do this. You are, how, how is this even going to be possible for you to do this? And that also speaks to that education piece and saying, no, this is possible. And I know so oftentimes we found when describing how to make something accessible, the ways that you're making it accessible are really straightforward. It's saying you're maybe we're making an activity accessible. Well, first it just needs to be well described and audible and tactile, but those differences aren't huge. And that understanding and that helps and that really needs to change in that that growth to say, no, this this is a low instance disability. And it may be something that people rarely or never come across. However, that, that communication needs to change on your, this is possible. And there are opportunities out there and these aren't unheard of. Yeah. And that really comes down to a lot of it seems to be kind of exposure, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and, and like you guys were talking about before getting kids into your programs and then them being able to bring that back to their community change people's perception, kind of change the mentality surrounding visual impairment to it's not that big of a deal for me mm-hmm. to run on my track team with a tether, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> there, there are so many adaptations and modifications that can be made that, that really aren't that big of a deal and, and just kind of take a little bit of knowledge and sort of mm-hmm. that kind of push in the right direction, the right resources to figure things out. I think just relieving some of the fear that some of the people mm-hmm. have in the community that they don't understand about visual impairments and blindness, because you talk about running on a tether and we, we look at some of our kids that go back and want to be on their track team and the coaches will give you a phone call and be like, well, I, I you know, they, they can't do it safely. And they're like, okay, this child has a sensory disability. Their entire mm-hmm. body works just like every other kid on your track team, exactly the same. <laughs> and they mm-hmm. don't stop to think about it because that's, that's not their way of thinking. That's not the way that they look at a person. They, they, they don't look at them as someone that can physically, I mean, look at the sports. They're endless for people that are blind. And so when you get to that point in that struggle of, of educating that people to look at people that are blind differently and understand that uh, we need to stop putting limits on people and, and we need to make uh, sure other people aren't putting limits on the kids and adults that, that we that we work with because it's, it's, to me, it just blows my mind when someone says, well, this kid shouldn't be able to run the high school team. Well, I, you can't make sense of that to me. That, that, mm-hmm. that makes no sense. There are certain sports that I think are no brainers. And when mm-hmm. people start asking you about them, you realize, well, we've, we, we, we got to work on that. We got We got to mm-hmm. get educate them about what these kids can do and adults. Yes. Yeah. It is kind of interesting to hear. Um, you know, I think we see this in, when people see someone with a visual impairment, like you said, they don't realize like 
a lot of the times that doesn't impact other parts of their functionality. Like Mm -hmm. the way that I experience the world and interact with the world might be a little bit different, but there aren't so many limitations that people imagine. Um, You can see this even in a really simple way. If someone with a visual impairment goes to the airport, for example, and asks for assistance, they will always bring a wheelchair, Mm -hmm. which doesn't make any sense. (laughs) (laughs) So I think that gives like a, you know, on on a very basic level, this kind of picture of how people just truly don't understand visual mm-hmm. impairment. So then, like you said, you bring that into this, the, you know, the athletic world where it's kind of like rough and tumble, it's, it's hardcore. And they're like, well, I don't know if kids can do that who can't see. So yeah, it really comes down to changing that perception, changing that mentality. Um, what experiences have you guys had, you know, where you've maybe seen Because some of those same ideas that come from parents or teachers of my child can't really do things, those unfortunately really can get ingrained into into kids to think for themselves that, oh, I I just can't do things like that. Um, Can you tell me about any experiences you've had with kids where that was kind of their starting point, but their experience with sports was able to change that in some way? I would imagine between the two of us, we have about a million, but person, do you have a <laughs> Yes, yes, I know. There's so many. There's so many. So many. It's hard to narrow down one, but so often I hear a narrative from campers or from athletes of, I can't, I'm blind, or I can't do this. And you know that that's something they've heard from someone else. Someone has told them they, that is a belief, that is a strong self-belief that they have. And that as that realization of, okay, what do you need? Is it going to be helpful if I show it to you with some tactile modeling? One time I had this camp, um, one of the programs that we do is through our sports adaptations is a large video resource library and had an athlete come in and he is, was in middle school at the time. He's now a high schooler and he is, has, is completely blind and came in and said, we were, we're talking about through some locomotor skills. So it was skipping. And so it was like, okay, we're going to do this video that describes how to teach skipping. And he said, I don't, I don't know how to skip. And I had worked with his PE teacher and had seen where that belief of, I can't do this. And so we pulled out a tactile map and it was just a piece of paper that had been laminated and broke down each step of the skipping body movement and each per each little human was outlined in puffy paint. And so he and I spent maybe three minutes together walking through it and talking through the cues that it's a hop and a step. And by the end of that, even though it was three minutes and for the most part, he was exploring the tactile diagram by himself. And I was giving a little bit of descriptions. He's asking some questions. And by the end, he was able to do a pretty solid introductory skipping. And that was three minutes later, that wasn't with any actual teaching. That was all with just some pre-teaching. And then as we progressed through it, it was, okay, this is how you do it. This is how to break it down. And his skill improved. And by the end, he was talking about, this is a skill that my peers have all said, like, oh, I know how to skip. Oh, this is something I learned in preschool. And he had never had that opportunity to do it because nobody took the time to say, this is important for you. So oftentimes what I hear is, what I'm sure we all hear is, well, what's the point? Why should this child learn how to juggle? Why should this child learn how to do this? Well, why does anybody learn how to do, how to juggle? Nobody's going to become a professional clown or anything <laughs> else, but we need to, to develop those skills, those proprioceptive skills and other skills, because those go into all areas of life. The, a child has a high level of that body awareness and all of those all those body awareness skills is going to have a higher skill in their orientation mobility and in every area of life. And then also for them to, if they want to pursue sport at any level, they have greater depth than that. So they need to be doing these skills in the same way their sighted peers are doing them. Yeah. You talk about skipping. We've got a lot of kids that can't even run. So Mm -hmm. talk about the complex skill of skipping and then Think about how much time you spend at your camps and clinics just trying to get kids to run appropriately Mm -hmm. and use opposition. And and it's so important. And I think for for us or in an envision, one of the things that we get most excited about when we think about experiences and stories with our athletes is when we push the limits. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes they're 
my favorite times is when you say, okay, we're going to maybe push this just a little harder than we would and see what happens. And I think uh, one of the stories that came to mind when Ben and Jillian and I were talking today is we went, we went kayaking and the water was a lot higher than it should. And there were trees down and, you know, here we are, we've got this whole group of kids and we've got 30 kayaks and we're like, well, we're not just going to walk away now. So we like do a little thing like, hey, it could get rough. And within a hundred yards, there were kayaks flipping, kids floating down the river and their life jacks, <laughs> lost shoes and hats. And it was, as you can imagine, just a little chaos. But when we were all done, we picked everybody up and got them back in their kayaks. There was this, this huge sense of accomplishment. Like we did something that was on the edge of being a risk. And, mm -hmm. but how it empowered our athletes, how it empowered our counselors, just how it said, like, look at us, we got on the other side, we're all safe. And we did something that we weren't even sure. Like we're constantly mm -hmm. trying to show other people like what athletes can do. But I think sometimes we just show to ourselves too, like we gotta mm -hmm. keep, you know, pushing that line to, to what we can do. We see it in skiing all the time. We see it in high ropes course all the time where doing that extra pushing that risk factor a little bit is such a thrill to watch when, and when you see people make mistakes and just get back up and go, well, I can do this again, you know, <laughs> taking a bad crash when they ski or whatever it is, just being able to, those to me are my most magical moments with them is sometimes it's the fails are our greatest successes. Mm -hmm. And, and just being able to like you don't really think of being uncomfortable as an op opportunity, but uh, I think when it comes to, you know, being blind or visually impaired, often people kind of like tiptoe around it and like, they just want you to be safe and comfortable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Kirsten, kind of like you were saying, like, that's just not how people grow. So when you're able to really provide these opportunities where people get to be uncomfortable, you know, like that is, that's where you, that's where you truly find empowerment because you realize that you can, you can survive that, you know, you can survive that and mm -hmm. you can, you can really learn from that. Um, yeah. And Kirsten, I, I liked what you said earlier, sort of about how we extrapolate the different skills that we, that we learn in kind of these smaller instances. Um, in, in a way it kind of, it makes me think of so often that uh, parents or teachers will not have their kids um, be involved in like a PE class, for example, mm -hmm. because it's just, it's too much. And um, I think you really hit on, you both have kind of talked about this piece of one being patient and understanding, like, how do we work around this, which takes a little bit of time. Um, but then also being able to really see the value in that, that, you know, a child might have to figure out the accommodations for being involved in their PE class. But from that, they get the experience of being on a team and working with other kids and overcoming challenges. And, you know, kind of like you were talking about that just, it provides kids so much outside of just, just that one experience. And I think a lot of the resources that Northwest has that Kirsten's talking about can go such a big distance too, in making sure that happens in the PE rooms and the PE mm -hmm. classroom, because it allows them to sit in the privacy of their office and go, oh, I could teach that. Mm -hmm. I don't have scared of correcting a kid that's blind. Mm -hmm. You know, that's always an issue too. And so it's it's been amazing some of that. We've got some excellent resources out there and we just need to spread the word so that everyone can use them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I know that both of you kind of came into the blind sports community with a sense of like, you know, believing in the abilities of those who are blind or visually impaired. Um, but I'm curious if, if any of that has changed for you throughout the course of your time working with the blind, is there, is there any part of that, you know, that even though you came into it with this, um, with this viewpoint of the blind as like very capable and able, you know, that's why you ended up in the positions you are, but is there any part of that, that like shifted for you at all throughout your experience? Yeah, so I had a unique experience. So I've been in this field for six years and actually a year ago, I lost my vision and I didn't know that when I was going into this field and it strengthened my, that I know that my experience in losing my vision was very different than a lot of other adults because I had the incredible blessing of being able to know people ahead of me of saying when I was hearing the, those narratives of you can't do this or um, all these negatives, it was like, 
No, that's not possible. I mentioned earlier about being able to look at look at other athletes as mentors of being able to have those conversations of how are you doing this? What are you doing this? Or um, what's been your experience of this? And I can, and we can relate in that way. And so it, it very much strengthened that resolve and that understanding of the importance of sports and physical activity and the abilities and gave me a unique perspective on why what the, what the importance of this is and what the importance of that empowerment and that ability to see of how being engaged in sports and physical activity transcends all areas of life, because being able to feel empowered in this area to say, I can do this. I have, I can, I know what the capabilities of my body and I can demonstrate that. And I can be fully engaged. I know how important that is and to strengthen even more of how I know how important that is for our athletes of all ages. Wow, that is a really unique experience, Kirsten. Mm-hmm. That is incredible. And, and I imagine that really helps you to, you know, provide even better um, resources to your community and, and connect even more mm-hmm. just having that experience. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, I'm not even going to try to follow up on that, except to <laughs> say that... <laughs> Her life and her life experiences are going to make her unstoppable. And she's going to do things in this community that are going to be so strong and so impactful. And I am so proud of this lady. <laughs> and so proud that, like, I don't, you know, we all, there's always a little divine intervention, I think. And, mm-hmm. and I think in Kirsten's life, there certainly has been. And when I see what she's accomplished before she's lost her vision. And when I think about what she'll accomplish now that that she has literally joined this community that she's embraced, there's there's a reason for it. And we're gonna be hearing about her for many, many years to come and the things that she does. And it, it just reinforces everything that I believe in and she's living it. And she, she will be able to give to athletes in a way that I never would be able to do. And she will have a perspective that I can only ever dream of having. So, you know, we just need more persons in this world. Not be on this journey without you. It's so, so cool how that transcends all corners of the U.S. It's wow. crazy. What an incredible connection. And I have to be honest, I didn't even realize the connection between you two. <laughs> you we're both speaking tonight. So <laughs> I think that is, a, I mean, what better people to have um, to kind of speak to this experience. So as we kind of, you know, look forward for our community, we've talked about the benefits and some of the hurdles. What are some of like, what are some of the steps that we need to take, you know, as individuals or as a community to, to kind of expand things, to get things to where they could be in the U.S.? I think that as a community of individuals whose, whose eye on the prize is education and awareness and opportunity for athletes that are blind, I think we've got to work together to really make sure that Mm -hmm. kids know where to go that we need to to have some type of online resource or something, some type of centralized thing so that if a parent's going, I'm here, where do I go? Like, I I just feel like there's so many lost families out there Mm -hmm. that one don't even know what's available. They don't know where to go to get it. You know, obviously we talked about, we really need to encourage to have more programming in the United States, but I, I think we have to work a little bit on on establishing some way for them to find us and mm-hmm. to find and and to get to where they need to go so that they can get the information that they need. Mm-hmm. I would agree. And going off of that, of thinking about from a funding aspect of there is such a huge push on academics and the expanded core curriculum, which are huge. And I firmly believe in And, but it's important to remember in those that it is cyclical and it is interdisciplinary and that as someone grows in their recreation leisure skills, those skills will spread into other areas. And that means that 
what funding is available and should be should be made available and continue to grow in education needs to be extended to that sports and physical activity because we know that individuals who have high levels of engagement in sports and physical activity show high levels in those other areas because they've learned skills that they can that they can employ in their daily living, in orientation mobility, in independence, in assistive technology, and see the importance of those. And to and as the each of those grow, they're going to create adults and other individuals who are able to fully give back to the community and to grow other individuals. And, and that that importance should never be downplayed. Yeah, really kind of considering the whole picture, you know, all of the, mm -hmm. and creating more comprehensive programming. Um, I, mm -hmm. I like what you said, Wendy, too, just about creating an easier resource for people mm -hmm. to find what is already out there. I yes. think that I think that covers kind of the two really big pieces of the puzzle is how do we get people connected to the programs that exist? And how do we create more programs throughout the U.S. that are comprehensive, that, like you said, in, include the expanded core, but also can include, you know, adaptive recreation and sports because we, we know how beneficial those are. Absolutely. I think we, we definitely have a, we have a ways to go in the U.S. and, and we know that just from mm -hmm the landscape of things, but, you know, I'm really, really grateful that we do have people out there like the two of you who are, who are working and connecting communities and just really getting people the resources that they need. Um, and thank you both so much for being here today. Um, kind of like you're talking about, we, we want to get more resources out there for people and especially having the technology that we do. So yes, thank you so much both for being here today and, and sharing your experiences, sharing some of your stories. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. For you. And for anyone who is interested in um, staying involved for the rest of the week, we have our social media takeovers uh, each day going through Saturday. Um, and we also have breakfast with champions. If you want to get involved in person, that's taking place in Colorado Springs on October 28th. Um, that's presented by Anthem, and there will be a live stream at 8 a.m. for anyone joining from around the country. Um, we'd love to see what everyone is doing, and this goes for you, Wendy and Kirsten, as well, um, that if you guys are doing anything to celebrate National Blind Sports Week and National Blind Sports Day on Saturday, we'd love to see what you guys are all doing. We'll make sure to share it across our social media platforms. Um, just a few quick updates about the cool things that are happening with USABA. We have our goalball teams in Berlin this week. So Wendy Callahan's over there and Eliana as well. Follow social media. And <laughs> yes, follow yeah. them on social media. <laughs> um, and yeah, we have the California International Marathon coming up in December. We have a few scholarships left for that if anyone is interested in running. And we have the naming of our first U.S. blind soccer team coming up later this year. Um, again, thank you both so much for joining us for National Blind Sports Week, uh, presented by the Healthy Vision Association. Uh, thank you, guys. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye. <laughs> awesome.